Good afternoon, everyone, on what is a very rainy day in Chicago. My name is Kaushik Sundar Rajan, and I'm Professor of Anthropology and Co-Director of the Chicago Center for Contemporary Theory, or 3CT, at the University of Chicago. It's my great pleasure to introduce you to the second of three teachings we are organizing through the center around the 2020 US presidential elections. We have a wonderful lineup of panelists with us today who will talk us through some of the stakes of this election for some of the different institutions of representative democracy in the country. Before I introduce them, I would like to say a few words about 3CT, about our teachings, and about the rationale for this particular teaching. But first, a few words of thanks. First, I would like to thank the Posen Family Center for Human Rights, the Center for the Study of Race, Politics, and Culture, the Chicago Center on Democracy, and U Chicago Votes for their generous co-sponsorship of this event. In the normal course, had this been an in-person event, we would have had the, used the occasion of our teaching to register voters. Um, since we cannot in this virtual format, I did want to read out this message from you, Chicago Votes. The U Chicago Votes is a nonpartisan voter engagement initiative working to make the University of Chicago a national leader in voter registration and turnout. Voting is one of the most critical actions we can take to shape our future and an important commitment we hope that the whole U Chicago community will embrace. Go to uchicago.turbovote.org to register to vote and get in election deadline reminders. Check out U Chicago Votes website at uchicagovotes.com to get all your voting related questions answered. If you're in Hyde Park, you can vote early in Hyde Park at the Ray School and follow U Chicago Votes on Facebook and Instagram for up to date information on voting locations and times. So um, we have those websites in the chat if anyone is local and would like to find out a little bit more about you, Chicago Votes. I would next, next like to thank my colleagues and staff at 3CT for making this event possible. My co-directors, Shannon Lee Doddy and Lisa Widin, steward the agendas and activities of the center, and I'm deeply grateful to them. Special thanks are due to Adam Getachu, who's a professor of political science and a fellow fellow at the center. Adam organized and moderated the first teaching in our series a couple of weeks ago. Um, and, and, and Adam has also co-conceptualized the entire series of events with me. Last but not least, special thanks to Anna Searle Jones, Carlo Diaz, and Joe Bonney and his team, which includes Vera Bellinson, Rupert Barron Rodriguez, and our captioner for today, Karen, um, for putting together all the infrastructure uh, and making this event possible. Anna is our wonderful associate director whom you've received notifications and emails from and who just popped up on chat here with various snippets of valuable information as she will continue to do. Her work in sight and vision is essential to the functioning of the center. Carlo and Joe have ensured that we have the virtual infrastructure to conduct this teaching and are ensuring its operation as I speak. The ability to sustain intellectual engagement through a time of virtuality requires an enormous amount of infrastructural labor. And I want to acknowledge and give thanks to Anna, Carlo and Joe for all the work they've done, not just to put together this event, but to build the infrastructural conditions of possibility for our being able to imagine and sustain such modes of engagement through the coming weeks and months. A little bit then about us and these modes of engagement before I go on to introduce our panel. 3CT is a space for the critical discussion and reimagination of social, political, and cultural processes in the world today. Simply put, this means the world is an overwhelming place at all times, but especially today. So how might we think through, take stock of, and perhaps even revision the constellation of structures, events, and forces that produce this contemporary moment? What is on the table here is a project of making sense in the belief and with the commitment that making sense of things helps us address problems and think, to, think towards better futures. The teaching is one modality of such sense-making. 
At 3CT, it has been a practice of ours to have teach-ins around elections and not just American ones. We had an important and fascinating one in 2014, for instance, after the Indian elections that brought Narendra Modi to power. But rarely have such conversations felt as necessary to us as they have these past few years, when we have organized teach-ins following the 2016 election, a day-long event organized by Shannon Doddy and graduate students, and also in concert with allied centers on campus around specific events, such as one in response to an invitation to Steve Bannon to speak on campus, which stimulated a whole set of important conversations around the history of the First Amendment and the ways in which it has been both curtailed and weaponized in today's political climate. We're organizing three teach-ins around this election. The first was two weeks ago, as I said, organized by my colleague, Adam Getachew, which explored the question of popular mobilization in electoral politics. For those of you who missed it, a video of that teach-in is available on 3CT's website, and Anna will put a link in there on chat for you if you would like to go and take a look. The third will be after the elections on January 15th, to think beyond the electoral moment. What does the election signify and where do we go from there? This particular teaching focuses on a specific issue. What are the stakes of this election for institutions of representative governance? There are three animating sentiments that underlie this question and the way in which we have structured our conversation, which I would like to lay out for you. First, and this is applicable to all three teachings, our job is not punditry. The purpose of these teachings is not to tell you who will win or what might happen on November 3rd. No doubt that's a matter of interest and concern for all of you who are joining us today and for billions of others around the world. But one of the things punditry as a genre risks doing is reducing elections to a spectator sport, a game that has a winner and a loser where the end point of democracy becomes winning. Elections as an end in themselves, validating the winner and vanquishing the loser. The consequences of this particular imagination of electoral politics, which at once trivializes and tribalizes elections, are itself being felt today under a president whose entire public life has been spent weaponizing this thin idea of winning as everything. Rather, second, the purpose of these teachings is in some measure to ask the question of the place of elections in a broader democratic project whose aims and ambitions are necessarily themselves unresolved and still contested. This is not to diminish the importance of elections. Indeed, we acknowledge the almost existential stakes of this one that is looming ahead of us, but it is to insist upon elections not as the end point of a reality TV show or a sports game where the winner takes all and does what he wants with it. And in America, alas, it's still what he wants when it comes to presidents but an essential and important punctuation in a larger project of figuring out how to live together in a polity. A larger project that has, since the beginning of the American democratic experiment, seen a constant and unresolved tension between a foundational commitment to the rule of law as a basic norm of representative governance and an equally foundational commitment to the expression of popular will and sentiment. And so thirdly, Institutions are a critical site through which this tension constantly plays out, gets resolved, gets unsettled again, gets put at stake. On the one hand, the last four years have seen a radical evisceration of the institutions of representative democracy in America in ways that have shaken the guardrails that protect us from authoritarianism and tyranny. On the other hand, institutionalist calls often contain within themselves their own inherent conservatism especially in light of the fact that many institutional histories, especially in their originalist fabrications, curtailed the expression of democratic sentiment as much as they enabled it. The question that is on the table, therefore, is a complex one. Why do the institutions of representative democracy matter? How are they under attack? But also, how might this moment provide the conditions of possibility for their reimagination and revitalization in ways that are more democratic more inclusive and more just. It is this dual relationship of institutions to democracy where questions of institutional robustness, reflexivity and revitalization are all at stake that we consider here. 
So I'm privileged to have a truly wonderful group of panelists to consider this with, and I will introduce them in the order in which they will speak. Daniel Biss, who will speak first, began his career as a mathematics professor at the University of Chicago before becoming an organizer and then elected official. He served as a member of the Illinois House and Illinois Senate and ran an insurgent grassroots campaign for the Democratic nomination for governor, coming in second in a crowded field. His campaigns and legislative service have all featured a strong commitment to public engagement, political reform, and economic justice. It's a great pleasure to welcome Daniel, who also happens to be the first American politician I ever voted for in an election after becoming a citizen in 2018. Daniel will be followed by Sami Moschenberg, who is an independent consultant working with progressive organizations to help strengthen grassroots capacity and engagement. Prior to starting her consultancy in July 2014, she was Director of Washington Operations for the National Council of Jewish Women, or NCJW, for whom she worked for more than 30 years. As head of the organization's Washington, D.C. office, Sami was instrumental in creating and expanding NCJW's benchmark judicial nominations campaign, which has educated and mobilized tens of thousands of activists throughout the U.S. since its inception in 2001. I'm delighted that Sami can join us in the midst of a lot of work she's doing around the Amy Coney Barrett Supreme Court nomination, not least because I've been inspired by her work for years, not just in the US, but also in South Africa, where she's worked on a number of advocacy issues, including around healthcare access with the Treatment Action Campaign. Sami brings to us, therefore, a wealth of experience with American struggles, but also a comparative perspective from working in South Africa. Sami will be followed by Sandeep Vahisan, who is legal director at the Open Markets Institute and previously served as a regulations counsel at the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. He has published articles and essays on a variety of topics in anti-monopoly law and policy. I'm especially grateful to have his insights here, having learned from years of research on the pharmaceutical industry, just how debilitating corporate monopoly is not just to health, but to democracy not just in the US, but around the world. Questions of monopoly and antitrust have tended in recent decades to become shielded from democratic scrutiny by adopting an esoteric and technocratic veneer, which Sandeep will strip aside for us in vital ways. Also in timely ways, given this week's antitrust moves against Google by the Department of Justice, which sets the stage for a politics of and towards monopoly capitalism over the coming months that's bound to be extremely consequential and that we should all attend to. Last but not least, Amanda Jarrett, who is a labor lawyer and currently works for the United Food and Commercial Workers, a union whose work has been incredibly high stakes during the pandemic, representing as it does frontline workers in grocery stores and the meatpacking industry. Amanda previously worked as an attorney at the National Labor Relations Board and as a law fellow with the AFL-CIO. They therefore bring insights to bear on the stakes of this moment for unions, both from the perspective of unions themselves and from that of an institution charged with the protecting of labor laws and labor relations, which has come under sustained attack from this administration. I first met Amanda as it happens in Washington, DC on that surreal night when Donald Trump won the election with a group of other labor lawyers and consumer protection lawyers who had all gathered together to watch the results together. It's a privilege to have them back in this forum nearly four years later, a time in which they have made, waged many heroic and essential struggles. Each of the speakers today is a practitioner, responding to but also helping to shape the terrain of politics that constitutes our contemporary moment. As an ethnographer myself, I've shaped my own research on the understanding that practitioners are social theorists. They have to constantly understand and make sense of the worlds they are both sculpting and holding at bay. It is the job of the research university and centers such as 3CP to invite them in and provide a forum where they can do so in conversation with each other and with all of you, hopefully for a moment without the weighty urgency that praxis imposes upon their work, especially at this short time. Thus, they are here to teach us, but also to dialogue with us. Our format, we hope, will engender such a dialogue. Each of the speakers will speak initially for four to five minutes, introducing themselves further, putting some topics of concern and consideration on the table. 
We'll then have a second round of exchange, which I will moderate, but which will also involve speakers asking questions of and responding to each other. We hope to have a significant amount of time for Q&A at the end, but the forum really would work best if all of you in the audience didn't just wait until the end to pose your questions. There's a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, as in when you have a question during the course of the presentations, please do type it in and I will collect and collate the questions and pose them to the speakers as we go along. With that, I turn with much anticipation and gratitude to Daniel Biss to get us started. Well, thank you so much for the uh, kind introduction and for, for assembling this really very, very interesting group of uh, people uh, for what I anticipate will be a, a fabulous discussion. And so, uh, though it is certainly not characteristic of you know current politicians and former academics to speak briefly, I'm going to do my absolute best to to be uh, efficient because I really look forward to the the other speakers and especially the discussion. Um, but as Kashik said, my name is Daniel Biss. Uh, this is a sort of a funny homecoming to me. I, I started uh, professional life as a mathematician uh, in Hyde Park at the University of Chicago. I actually dug up for this my, my button here, a, a special button uh, made for mathematicians to support the Graduate Students United effort, uh, struggle to uh, attain union recognition on campus. Um, and I always feel a kind of a, a warmth and affection and nostalgia and kind of honestly existential confusion when I uh, uh, got to participate in a University of Chicago event of some kind. So, so thank you for that. Uh, but nowadays I'm, I'm a practitioner in, in politics. I spent eight years in the legislature from uh, 2010 through 2018. And uh, I was asked to speak today a little bit about kind of the institution of parties and the interaction between the kind of power structure inside of political parties and kind of grassroots energy that tries to uh, mold and affect them. And my, my own um, path into the legislature, I think, is, is a useful example in thinking about this. Uh, you know, I, look, no one ever joins a mathematics faculty as part of a multi-step plan to eventually become an elected official. This was not, this was not the, the long-term intent. It was a pretty dramatic change of, of plan that arose because of my passion for issues, that arose because you know, I started at the university in the fall of 2002, uh, just six months before the invasion of Iraq. I saw our country uh, lurching toward a war that was based on what were, even at the time, obviously lies. And, and it felt like we were becoming unmoored from reality and empiricism and truth in a way that just seemed kind of uh, reckless and dangerous. And I felt like I had to involve myself somehow in got involved in activism and organizing and one thing went to another and eventually the next thing I knew I was wearing a suit and pushing green and red buttons in the Capitol building in Springfield, Illinois. The, the point of that story for the purposes of today's discussion is that that path from uh, ideological conviction and activism into a uh, legislative seat was at that time not especially common for democratic legislators in Illinois. Uh, there were a lot of my colleagues, you know, you, you know the, the stereotypes, right? There are a lot of my colleagues whose parents had held the seat before them and so forth, or were part of some sort of corrupt machine. But there are also a lot of my colleagues who were there in, in non-sinister ways, but ways that had very little to do with activism or ideology, that they had they'd gotten a summer job with the park district when they were in college, and that led them into a career of public service that was, um, that was noble, uh, but based more kind of in um, constituent service than an ideology, let's say, or, or, or there were people who had been um, kind of brought up in a, in a ward organization in the city of Chicago and so forth. And so the idea that someone would be propelled into a legislative seat by virtue of their own convictions on issues and, and kind of eager to, to ideologically shape the direction of the state was relatively atypical for democratic legislators at the time. That is no longer the case. So for instance, there was a an episode that occurred after I left, but in the uh, spring of 2019 in the Illinois House where there was, um, there was a reproductive rights legislation that had passed through the Illinois Senate and was pending a vote in the Illinois House. The Speaker of the House, Michael Madigan, clearly wanted there not to be a vote on the bill. He clearly felt it would be too controversial. And so he assigned the bill to a committee whose chair was gonna kill the bill. And, and he'd sort of solved his political problem by stopping this bill from moving. And there was a 
a large group of newly elected women Democratic members who, frankly, when I, in my first term would not have existed, uh, who had run for reasons of, again, genuine commitment to policy issues, who believed that it was critical for their ability to advance the goals they had run to advance for this bill to pass, who went to the speaker and said, dude, you gotta, you gotta call this bill for a vote. We're, we're not gonna allow this. We're not gonna allow some sort of abstract notion of party solidarity to shield certain members in swing districts from this vote to overwhelm the ideological and philosophical commitments that led us to seek office. And, and they won. They, they were able to persuade the speaker to back down simply because the arithmetic showed him that he didn't have enough support in his caucus to continue to maintain his position. And, and that, that is just very simply a shift in the balance of power, of, you know, technically, of course, in the Democratic caucus in the Illinois General Assembly, but more fundamentally in Democratic Party politics in Illinois, away from a kind of centrally controlled uh, uh, kind of self-preservationist model to a grassroots driven model. And, and I, I, I'm not a historian of these things. So I'm not suggesting this is, this is uh, uh, that this shift is sui generis, it's not. This is kind of part of a constant um, pendulum that swings back and forth, but it, it's a dramatic change and it's a change that has left many of the more senior and experienced members of the Democratic Party in Illinois kind of baffled and unsure of the world around them, which is of course precisely the same phenomenon you see if you talk to members of Democratic members of Congress who have been around for a decade or more who are trying to figure out what in God's name it means that people like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and now uh, Jamal Bowman and Cori Bush are being elected. I, I think that transformation is uh, because it's happened during all kinds of other things around the Trump presidency. It, it's it's received actually less attention than it than it probably deserves, and and could be, in my view, the key to a really different and transformational upcoming moment in American politics. So, with that, I'm uh, very excited to hear what Sammy Moshenberg has to say, and I very much look forward to the rest of this uh, afternoon's discussion. Thanks, Daniel. Um, I'm here to talk about the courts. And um, in the aftermath of um, the Amy Coney Bryant um, nomination, yesterday we had um, the markup in the Senate Judiciary Committee. It's almost as though the US Senate heard we were doing this uh, webinar and decided to you know, set us up for something really relevant. But I want to start by moving back further. As Koshik said, I worked for many decades, for several decades, for the National Council of Jewish Women. Back when um, Bush was Bush W. George W. was um, elected, or about to be elected as president, um, we took a look at the lay of the land and realized that he had the opportunity to fill about a third of the federal judiciary. And it was quite clear that the people supporting him and that the Republicans, that conservative Democrats even, but conservatives understood that the real um, nexus of power was in the courts. After all, federal judges serve for a lifetime. So not only could they sit on the court if they're young enough when they start, like Amy Coney Barrett, for 30 years, Amy Coney Barrett could serve until 2055. Um, but the precedents that they establish go on for even another generation. So it's a way in which it's the most, probably the most important legacy a president leaves. And it's certainly the judges the president um, nominates and are confirmed go way longer than the term of a president. So the National Council of Jewish Women decide, looked around and saw that um, there were not a lot of progressive organizations um, really making a campaign out of the federal judiciary. Everybody was involved in particular battles over particular nominees, both in the lower courts as well as in the Supreme Court. Um, many of us remember the Robert Bork battle which I was engaged in with NCJW, which was a victory for us. Um, but there was no, nobody took it to the next level. 
and conservatives were very much so. But people understood that we had to do something. When Bush was running for re-election and Republicans were chanting four more years, NARAL Pro-Choice America came out with a button that just said 40 more years. And um, it was obviously a conversation starter. People would look at it and go, what do you mean 40 more years? We're talking about four more years. But in fact, the judges that George W. Bush was gonna nominate were gonna serve for 40 years. And there became, um, there was a, just a general sensibility that what we had to do was educate progressives that this is an issue they need to take into the voting booth. Because this issue, the issue of who sits in lifetime seats on the federal court subsumes every, or is every other issue is subsumed under that issue. Whether it's reproductive rights, whether it's environmental justice, whether it's worker rights, regardless of what it is, it's the federal courts that are going to have the last say. And we've got a president now who has appointed more than 200 and he's gotten more than 218 federal judges confirmed, which is 25% of the total judgeships in this country. And if, I should say when, but I refuse to give up the fight, if Amy Coney Barrett is confirmed and the vote will be on Monday evening coming up, he will have appointed one third of the Supreme Court. And that's, that's frightening. That's, um, that says to those of us who are concerned about the policies promulgated by the Trump administration, are concerned about the ideology that um, Trump supporters um, espouse, that says that that ideology is gonna be entrenched in lifetime seats on the court. So we've been working very hard to educate progress the progressive community that courts matter and judges matter and that they have a role in it. This is not something that is decided by the executive branch and then that's all she wrote. Every Senator has to vote on every single judicial nominee for a confirmation to take place. So we elect our senators um, and our senators are the entry point for getting involved and being more involved in judicial nominations. And the message is starting to get out. Um, and we had a, a Pew poll in August showed that Whereas 68% of voters polled said healthcare was very important, 64% said the Supreme Court. A lot of progressive polls, by the way, don't even segment out the Supreme Court or the federal judiciary. They talk about issues and you have to make the connect between reproductive rights and the federal courts. So there are now progressive organizations trying to make that connect for voters. And this is what's at stake in this election and every election. So with that, I'm happy to turn it over to Sandeep. Thank you. Great, thanks so much, Sammy. And thanks to Kaushik, Anna, and their colleagues for organizing this great event and inviting me to participate. I will be talking about antitrust law and corporate power and the nascent signs of dramatic change that we've seen over the past few weeks. So over the past several decades, antitrust has been a, in a sad, bad, and deeply technocratic place. But you know the events of the past two weeks give me tremendous hope about the near term as well as the medium term. So I think looking back a little bit, the reconstruction of antitrust is still an underappreciated part of the neoliberal counter-revolution that began in the 1970s. Uh, starting late in that decade, the Supreme Court started initiating a reconstruction of antitrust, a reconstruction that was soon after joined in full measure by the Reagan administration. So there's a profound ideological shift in antitrust. The courts and the executive branch transformed the laws from anti-monopoly, which means taming the economic and political power of corporations, to consumer welfare. And since that time, we really had a bipartisan consensus 
and commitment to consumer welfare. There really hasn't been ideological deviation from Republican to Democratic administrations. Uh, but in reality, this model of consumer welfare is not produced to lower prices or protected consumer interests. What it has actually done is concentrated economic and political power at the very top of our economy. In other words, it's promoted oligarchy. So I think to really appreciate the destructive effects of our present antitrust system, we have to go into some of the nitty gritty of the rules and the doctrines. And I'm going to focus on two in particular. So a prevailing assumption is that corporate mergers are generally desirable. They help businesses acquire economies of scale and other productive efficiencies and thereby lower their cost structures and ultimately prices to consumers. So this pro-merger theory in practice means firms have carte blanche to buy rivals, suppliers, distributors, and really any other firm that they want. And in a given year, the Department of Justice and Federal Trade Commission stopped very, very few mergers, typically under 10, rarely more than 15. And as a result, we've seen numerous merger waves since the early 1980s. And unsurprisingly, the economy is highly concentrated everywhere we look. We see markets dominated by three or four firms, or increasingly dominated by a single firm. A good example that's been in the news this week is online search, where Google dominates the market and is surrounded by stunted, non-threatening rivals. So on the one hand, there's an accommodation and indeed encouragement of corporate consolidation. On the other hand, there's a hostility to any type of collusion among rivals, big or small, and more broadly speaking, cooperation. So this anti-collusion rule targets everyone from giant oil companies, pharmaceutical companies, down to independent contractors who work as gig economy in the gig economy or serve as home health aides. Uh, the Supreme Court in a 2004 decision described horizontal collusion as the supreme evil of antitrust. And the Department of Justice and FTC have prosecuted international cartels but also associations of independent contractors and professionals who do not have the right to organize under federal labor or antitrust law. For example, the FTC has prosecuted music teachers, ice skating coaches, public defenders, and physicians for organizing, and really cast a shadow over organizing by all independent contractors and small firms. So the effect of these rules is Concentration of power among a small group of corporations, really their shareholders and executives who wield tremendous power in today's political economy. And on the other hand, the atomization of workers, small firms and consumers who cannot band together to resist and fight concentrated corporate power. And I think Uber is a really powerful and telling case study. This is a company backed by venture capital firms, Jeff Bezos, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, SoftBank, that's burned through tens of billions of dollars in an attempt to create a global taxicab monopoly. And it's in the process of buying Postmates and building a three-form oligopoly in food delivery, which is very important at, at a time when we're all, or many of us are confined at home. So antitrust has basically done nothing to thwart Uber's quest for domination. It can monopolize markets and buy competitors and face little or no antitrust scrutiny. On the flip side, Uber drivers cannot organize though because they're misclassified as independent contractors. These drivers who are disproportionately black and brown cannot organize. In fact, the FTC and DOJ in a 2017 amicus brief stated that organizing by Uber drivers would be a per se or categorical violation of antitrust law. So Uber is a powerful illustration of how antitrust concentrates the power of capital and disperses and atomizes the power of everyone else in the economy. So everything I've said thus far has painted a relatively bleak and hopeless picture, but I think there are real signs of hope just looking at what's happened thus far in October. So earlier this week, the Department of Justice and 11 state attorneys general filed a monopolization suit against Google, uh, likely the biggest anti-monopoly suit since the government sued Microsoft in 1998. And the government laid out a clear, coherent theory on why Google should be liable under the Sherman Act. And earlier this month, the House Antitrust Subcommittee published a detailed, carefully crafted report uh, reaching 450 pages in length that laid out the exclusionary and other unfair practices, as well as hundreds of acquisitions of the big four in technology, Apple, Amazon, Google, and Facebook. And this was a report authored by Democrats. And 
that found some limited buy-in from Republicans. So you're really seeing a growing anti-monopoly sentiment among Democrats. Antitrust was a prominent issue in the Democratic primary and highlighted by Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders. And even on the right, there is some limited and perhaps opportunistic embrace of antitrust, at least against the big tech companies. So I think there's a real possibility for dramatic change. If Joe Biden is elected, he has a golden opportunity to break with the bipartisan consensus, including the policies and practices of the Obama administration on antitrust, and forge a new anti-monopoly policy regime and ultimately coalition. The question for us is, will he seize this moment? So with that, I'll turn it over to Amanda to talk about labor law. Thanks, Sandeep, and thanks to Koshik Anna, and the 3CT folks for hosting this great conversation today. As you probably know, during the Trump administration, attacks on workers' rights have accelerated and intensified. And to help orient you to the distinctiveness of what's happened over the last four years, I just want to take a step back and talk a little bit about where labor law comes from and uh, how it's developed. So in the late 19th and early 20th century, when workers spoke up, protested, or went on strike for better working conditions, they routinely faced retaliation, firings, and even violence. And in response, Congress enacted the National Labor Relations Act in 1935. This was an ambitious law that treated worker collective action as the foundation of all other workplace rights. It protected many private sector workers, but importantly left many others out. Labor law has always excluded agricultural workers and domestic workers, denying them the basic right to organize. These exclusions, which disproportionately affect black and brown workers, were intentional, part of a cynical effort to secure votes for the act. The act has also always excluded supervisors and independent contractors, but those exclusions have become yet more salient in the decades since the act was enacted because the share of employment in white collar and professional settings has increased and firms have sought to avoid creating employment relationships at all, owing to some of the dynamics Sandeep just laid out for you that um, have a kind of common origin. Other groups of workers like graduate students are not specifically mentioned in the act at all. The importance of protection under labor law to me is that without a union, workers can be fired for any reason or no reason. Unions promote pay equity and combat workplace discrimination in all of its forms. Simply put, collective bargaining remains the most potent antidote to favoritism, arbitrariness, and income equality in our economic system. But what's most important, I think, for this conversation is that labor law protects the fundamental right to stand up and speak out with one's coworkers. When workers have confidence in their own power and in their voices, that has spillover effects that can change everything about how our society works. To understand a little bit about how labor law develops and what's happened in the Trump administration, I just want to explain a little bit that the National Labor Relations Act became law in 1935. And apart from some significant amendments in 1947 and 1959, the text has remained nearly unchanged since then, despite tremendous uh, economic shifts in the intervening decades. The responsibility for modernizing and adapting the law to these changing circumstances falls to the National Labor Relations Board, the federal agency responsible for administering the law. For a few decades after World War II, there was an uneasy compromise favoring collective bargaining. But beginning in the Reagan administration, the shift toward deregulation and the iconic firing of the air traffic controllers by the Reagan administration when they went on strike unleashed new employer and political hostility hostility toward unions. There's been some back and forth over the decades since, and they've become increasingly pitched. Labor issues tend to arise in concrete moments of conflict, like a strike or a firing or a bargaining dispute. And the NLRB typically decides cases one by one as they arise. Customarily, customarily there are five members of the NLRB, three from the president's political party, two from the minority party. And so what you've had for at least the last 35 years or so, are these significant policy oscillations from administration to administration, especially when it comes to those foundational questions about who the law protects. During the Trump administration, the NLRB has reversed precedent in a manner that hurts workers' rights in 25 cases. Every one of these changes makes it harder for workers to organize allows employers to use their property rights as a weapon to undermine the right to organize and whittled away workers' right to speak out and go on strike. 
importantly, the NLRB has refused to take on its task of updating the law to reflect the economy that we live in. Um, the board has taken a very formalistic view of the employment relationship and has excluded so many additional workers from the act's protection, especially those who've been misclassified as independent contractors. The real harm of this approach is that the Trump NLRB has allowed employers to have it both ways, full control over the workforce and all the implicit unequal bargaining power that comes with it, with none of the accompanying responsibility. And the problem with this is that the Trump administration has begun to entrench these deeply anti-worker stances, not just in those case-by-case -case developments through adjudication, but actually using a tool that the NLRB has not historically turned to very much, rulemaking. And it's a kind of esoteric distinction between these two modes of proceeding, but this represents a really significant shift. And it's one that um, maybe those of you in the audience who followed the story of the Graduate Students United effort at Chicago are familiar with. Um, the issue of whether graduate student workers are protected by the act has gone back and forth from administration to administration. And this time around, in an effort to avoid having the deeply anti-worker Trump NLRB rule on the question, no cases that presented the issue were brought before the board. The board struck back by initiating a rulemaking proceeding to just take up the question itself. And in so doing, it broke with tradition and usurped the role of Congress by doing much more than the kind of interstitial policy making that normally happens in a particular factual setting. This is a really significant change that also invites judicial hostility against workers um, along the lines of what Sammy was talking about. We know there's a serious problem with the way the federal judiciary is currently composed. And there's every reason to believe that if a very bad anti-worker rule like a graduate student exclusion from the National Labor Relations Act were to be implemented, that would have lingering consequences and would likely be taken up by the courts. Despite all of what's happened in the Trump administration, I also am cautiously optimistic about what might happen in a Biden administration. I think we've seen tons of exciting and novel organizing efforts in sectors where we haven't traditionally seen that kind of energy, most notably among journalists. There have been a huge number of successful organizing efforts, even under a deeply problematic administration. We also see major efforts across the board to resist worker misclassification. Workers at Amazon and um, Instacart and many other gig companies are rising up to try and resist the way they've been treated as independent contractors, which denies the reality of employer control that dictates their working lives. We see this in California with an effort to um, enshrine this kind of exemption in Proposition 22, uh, which is up on the ballot this election. My hope is that after a good result in this coming election, which we all hope for, workers can win back some of the legal protections that they've lost during the Trump administration. But the law is only ever a tool to aid workers' efforts to build power. The important thing is that workers continue to exercise their voice on the job, and that will help us achieve, I hope, some of the unfulfilled promises of democracy. Thank you all very much, uh, so much. This was this was a really um, wonderful round of presentations and insights. Um, I would invite audience members to to start putting questions in the Q and A box um, as and when you have them. I know that 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 some have started already coming in, um, and and I'll turn to those as we go along. But I also wanted to invite. The panelists, maybe, um, however you choose to do so, to respond to each other and maybe elaborate upon some of some of some things that might have come up in in each other's presentations that that you might want to pull forward at at this stage. So um, I'm especially grateful to the panelists and interested in what everyone had to say. And as somebody who's concentrating on the courts a lot, I'm very aware of the role that dark money is playing um, in not only judicial selection, but also in court cases themselves. And um, 
people think of that dark money as being like the Federalist Society or organizations that are right wing and care about social issues. But a lot of that dark money is corporate money. Um, we know that the um, uh, Koch brothers are extremely um, interested in um, the judiciary and extremely concerned. So a lot of uh, Sheldon Whitehouse, the Senator from Rhode Island who sits on the Judiciary Committee gave a brilliant clinic almost on um, dark money and the judiciary at the Amy Coney Barrett hearings, which I hope people got a chance to see. But I would love to hear from Amanda and Sandeep and Daniel, um, anyone else about what they see in terms of uh, corporate manipulation of the courts and judicial uh, nominations process. I definitely have a reaction to that and I'm glad for the question. You know, something that has come up very recently in the what we hope are the waning days of the Trump administration is a broadside challenge to uh, one of the most foundational doctrines in labor law, which um, gives a kind of roadmap for how a company and a union deal with their bargaining relationship and prevent um, disturbances for a fixed period of time. This is called the contract bar doctrine. And this is something that um, has come before the board for challenge uh, as a result of one of the like most significant donors to Trump's campaign, a company called Mount Air Farms, which mo most of us have probably never heard of. And Jane Mayer did a really fantastic expose about the company in The New Yorker, which I would commend to everyone's reading that really traces all the kind of dark money that um, has you know, circulated before uh, Trump was elected and you know, throughout the administration. You know, shows that this is the kind of um, actor that the administration feels accountable to and will stop at nothing, even you know, threatening these really foundational bedrock legal principles if that's something the company's asking for. I would describe antitrust since the 1970s as really the story of corporate money's power. And this goes back to corporate funding of the law and economics movement persuading lawyers and legal scholars to apply simple and really simplistic neoclassical economic theory to questions like antitrust and public utility regulation and persuading important uh, segments of these groups that you know, traditional restrictions on corporate prerogatives, traditional public utility rules were actually harmful to the public interest. Uh, you know, the remaking of antitrust didn't involve Congress passing new laws. It involved conservative and many centrist judges and bureaucrats reinterpreting the law with virtually no public input. And, you know, I think one powerful example of this is the uh, law and economic seminars that various conservative groups organize for judges, whereby judges are invited to a luxury resort somewhere in, in, in the country, treated to you know, all, ex all expenses paid weekend getaway where they're exposed to right-wing propaganda and taught to think about corporate power and regulation in a pro-monopoly, anti-public interest fashion. And there was a study a couple of years ago that found that I believe a majority of federal district court and appellate judges have attended one of these seminars and attendance in at one of these seminars was correlated with the greater likelihood of ruling in favor of business interests. And they've been so successful that they've persuaded many, you know, self-described liberals that their view of the world is right. So since the seventies, many antitrust decisions have been unanimous joined by people like Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Elena Kagan and Stephen Breyer. So they've achieved a bipartisan victory that's only slowly coming under critique and facing resistance. But until the past few years, there was a consensus that they were correct and the disagreements that existed were fairly marginal ones. So I was, I was wondering if I, could, if I could push this along a little bit because this, this question of, of dark money is a very 
consequential one. But, but I was also wondering if some of you could reflect a little bit about how that interacts with money that's considered more legitimate, right? And I don't know, light money or whatever, which is that, that it seems like there's a sort of, I mean, I mean, what you've suggested, Sami, is that there is, that if you follow the money, then money influences outcomes and money influences power. But Sandeep, you're also suggesting through these, you know, through these law and economic seminars and so on, that there's a knowledge component to this. There's a common sense that's been formed over a period of time, right? So how does dark money interact with something like Wall Street, financial markets? Um, how does it interact with a common sense around austerity politics, which seem to have been a bipartisan consensus as well for much of the last 30 years until it's perhaps breaking down now a little bit in the Democratic Party. And, um, and also, Daniel, I was wondering if, if you could tell us a little bit about how some of those debates have played out in, in the state legislature around things like pensions and the state budget and, and, and those kinds of things. Yeah, I mean, I, I, would, I would start where you began, which is to, um, I mean, I love Jane Mayer's work as well, but but I, I would question the relevance or even the reality of the distinction between dark and, and, and light money nowadays. You know, the the um, I think so many kind of veils have been ripped off and so much um, so much um, so many norms have been broken and lines have been crossed that the the stated purpose of uh, transparency and disclosure, which is to have electoral consequences of uh, the expenditure of unsavory money are, are, almost, are almost gone now. And I, I think that frankly, the, the utilization of all of these secret mechanisms to funnel money around are, is, is you know, partially it's, it's because of that still, right? It's still a little embarrassing, you know, if your entire campaign is funded exclusively by, you know, polluters and, and so forth. But I think it's even more just to protect the privacy of the donors, right? Like it's kind of, it got kind of annoying to be the Koch brothers after a while because people were picketing their houses and stuff. It wasn't that their, their money was less efficaciously spent. It was just like they were sick of, of being targeted. And so I think a lot of very, very wealthy and corporate donors just want to avoid that hassle. And, and so choose to give, you know, through 501c4s and other, use other mechanisms to keep the money dark. Um, but, you know, the expectation of the public is so profoundly cynical at this point uh, that I think that um, I think it's really hard to to hurt a candidate by saying, "Oh, you took this gross money; people shouldn't vote for you anymore." Um, you know, I, I think that the the challenge that I observed is that the standard mechanism for funding a campaign is to become Certainly, in the in the contribution limits environment, in a in a in a contribution limits free environment, there's other pathologies. But in a contribution limits environment, the standard mechanism to fund a campaign is to become an absolute savant at getting the kinds of people who can write thousand dollar checks to like you. And there is a kind of a homogeneity among that set of people around the kind of what you might call neoliberal consensus. That, uh, that is really, really extreme. And so if, you're, if your job as a candidate is to become a kind of scientist of you know, pleasing this collection of people, if you spend every waking and sleeping moment kind of optimizing your conversational modalities in an effort to be really, 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 really good at making someone who can write a thousand dollar check, go ahead and do that. You, you just become a, incredibly attuned to these um, these sets of assumptions. And you know, what, I, what I found so striking as I went through that work was just how profoundly ignorant so many of these donors were about, well, so how, how ignorant they were about the functioning of government and also how uninterested they were in questioning the assumptions, the assumptions about the danger of deficits, the growth, the problems associated with high taxation of the wealthy, 
uh, the growth problems associated with proper regulation of capital and so forth. It wasn't, it wasn't as though these were kind of debating societies where everybody had worked out their, their differences and arrived at a consensus and then moved forward. It was just like a fairy tale somebody had been told, you know, right before they went to sleep when they were seven one time and then never asked any more questions, but then s distributed that, that fairy tale to our policymakers every time they handed out another thousand dollar check that lubricates the process of government. That to me was the danger. And I think you can read the shadows of that phenomenon all over our policymaking processes across this country. Thank you. So this, this leads to a question that David Ennis has asked in uh, the Q&A box, which is what are the best political strategies to address money for lobbying and influencing elections efficiently? And maybe we can tie it to another question that David has also asked, which has to do with federal judiciary appointments. Um, again, you know, what's the best political strategy? In some cases, you know, with, with judiciary appointments, David asks, is a constitutional amendment necessary? Um, you know, li li like, like how do we think about the dynamic interaction between legislative pressure, um, union organizing, constitutional amendments? Um, in, in your activities, how, how do you know where to go? How do we as citizens know where to go? Well, I, I just want to put out there very quickly that you don't need a constitutional amendment to change um, details of the judiciary, to add more seats to the Supreme Court, to put in term limits. Article three of the Constitution really only says, hey, there should be a Supreme Court. And if you want lower courts, that's OK, too. And, um, you know, go for it. I, I mean, literally. Um, well, not literally, but um, that's essentially the the sense of the of Article Three of the of the Constitution. So a lot of this is in the hands of Congress, and um, which is why you're hearing this become a debate issue, and um, you know one of the solutions being proposed to a court system, not just the Supreme Court, but overall that's been stacked with um, conservative ideologues. Um, so I leave it to others to answer the question about money. Um, I mean, Citizens United changed everything and uh, destroyed really good faith efforts that Congress made. I mean, it was a bit compromised, but that Congress made to try to rein in um, campaign finance to try to um, figure out a better way to finance campaigns. And then Citizens United just blew it out of the water. Yeah, on the courts issue, I think the objectives are at least twofold. So first is changing the composition of the courts, fewer federalist society types, fewer corporate lawyers, fewer prosecutors, more public defenders, more labor lawyers, more plaintiff's attorneys, and, and also more diverse judges, fewer older white males. But I think the progressive goal has to be more ambitious than that and has to be about limiting the power of the courts. The Supreme Court shouldn't be our national policymaker in so many important areas, whether it's healthcare, tax policy, antitrust, labor law, you name it. Congress has to reassert its power and remind the American public that it is the national legislature, it answers to us and should be making policy in most of these areas. So one source of this uh, judicial supremacy is Congress's basic failure to govern over the past several decades, either through just simple passivity and allowing the courts to step into the vacuum or alternatively by you know writing broad open-ended statutes and punting all the important decisions either to the executive branch or the judiciary. So this is partly a reflection of congressional failure, and that's something that can change very quickly. Yeah, I, I fully echo that. And you know, as I said in my kind of opening remarks, this is one of the chronic problems in labor law that we have a statute that really has not been touched in, you know, most of the past seventy years, and that necessarily means there are questions that arise like the status of graduate student workers or employees of a gig company 
that were really never contemplated in the way that um, we would hope our national legislature would take on issues of such significance. And the result of that necessarily is this kind of patchwork effort on the part of better administrations that have control of the executive branch to try and put forward the best faith interpretations of these very broadly worded laws that they can. And, you know, that's a commendable project and it's the best that we can hope for with what we have right now, but it's not necessarily an adequate substitute. You know, for my part, I'm really encouraged in the workers' rights realm that the House passed um, the Protecting the Right to Organize Act, which is a very significant labor law reform vehicle. And, you know, if we have a different composition for the Senate, which we all hope for after the election, that could be a really big shift. And, you know, I think that increased role for legislative action is pretty significant. Um, There's a real unwillingness, um, the way things stand now, uh, among progressive activists to open certain issues to congressional meddling. Um, people are concerned that um, once Congress gets a hold of it, they're gonna make things worse, even, in the, even though the goal was to make things better. And that's because it's not just about Democrats and Republicans, it's about um, who, you know, a lot of the Democrats have been there for years and years and are completely entrenched, have um, very conservative viewpoints, don't have a, a grounding in the real world, um, probably wouldn't know what you were talking about if you're talking about graduate student unions. Um, so it it's even worse than just on paper seeing which party controls which house. And there's a, there's a reluctance for that and we suffer for it um, because then we're left with what so-called activist courts. Um, and they're usually conservative activist courts that end up rewriting the law and reinterpreting the law well beyond what Congress wanted. To just to, to add, just from my own area of experience, which is in, in legislators, legislatures, I would say, um, I, 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 I will feel like answering this question is really critical because we can, I completely agree with every word that Sammy said, um, but I wanna add something to it. As, as dangerous as Citizens United was, I think we can, we can find ourselves in a position of unnecessary fatalism and Mm -hmm. it's important to note that Citizens United leaves open doors that are still really meaningful. So I would say that public financing of camp campaigns, for instance, through a small dollar matching system like what they have in New York City and now in a number of other jurisdictions across the country, it makes a real difference. It makes a real difference in making the elected bodies younger, more diverse, less male, and more responsive to grassroots activists and donors. And it's clearly constitutional, even according to these kind of wacky current courts. And so it's something that I think we, we should really be pushing for in state and local jurisdictions, not to mention the federal government. And of course, the US has to pass it. Am I allowed to ask a question of a fellow panelist? Um, I just wanted to ask Sammy a question about something that Sandeep said, because I, I, I think it's, it's really a, a, a tricky question um, in sort of figuring out how we move forward. Um, I think progressives have done a really, really good, and in my view, admirable, admirable job of connecting um, judicial appointment questions with certain key issues, especially reproductive rights, but to some extent, LGBT equality also. And I think those successes have borne fruit, right? So like, I'm, I'm relatively uh, optimistic that a democratic president would uh, appoint judges who I would feel comfortable with on those issues. Now, the right has managed to create this like 87 item litmus test menu where the judges who they get appointed agree with them on all of these things. And progressives have had a more mixed level of success on questions of corporate power and antitrust and even sometimes around financial regulation. So I'm wondering, Sammy, what do you think the right steps are? Is it, is it plausible for us to try to expand the scope of issues that we uh, try to hold presidents accountable on judicial appointments? And if so, how do we go about that? Um, first of all, 
um, the left would say they have no litmus test. And um, of course the right says that too, but then they go ahead and say, any judge I will appoint as Trump did will overturn the ACA and overturn Roe. But the left never says that. The left says, we want judges who are fair and independent and um, uh, faithful to constitutional values and rights, which is a very um, loose description. I mean, I know, I use that when I talk and I know what that means, but it doesn't, um, it doesn't translate to a list with boxes to check. So that's first of all. Second of all, I, I think that some progressives understand the connection between the courts and reproductive rights as you suggested, um, but it doesn't mean that they, um, that that's a particularly salient issue for voting. And that's the difference between the right and left. Um, exit polling in 2016 showed that more than a quarter of Trump's voters said that the Supreme Court was the most important factor in their decision. That's not the case with the left. I mean, they might say healthcare is or reproductive rights or um, environmental rights, um, but um, it's not clear that um, they draw the immediate connect to the Supreme Court. So I wish it were just as easy as saying, hey, progressives, let's expand the list of issues. We want um, judicial nominees to um, be good on. Um, but that list, that list doesn't exist. Um, at least it hasn't in the last White Houses, which is why um, Barack Obama appointed um, people who were relatively moderate and not necessarily reliable on some of these issues. He didn't put flaming liberals on the court. Merrick Garland was somebody who we were dreading to see as a nominee for a Supreme Court vacancy because he was so damned moderate. So, um, and I don't know if a Biden presidency would be a whole lot different, which is just, I hate to be Debbie Downer here, but anyhow. But, but Sammy, to, to build on that and, and more generally to all of you to, to build on that with a kind of more academic question, which is, in and, 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 and in this I'll draw upon a couple of other questions in the chat box, which is, how might words and discourses matter in building another political imaginary? So for instance, Martin Levine asks, um, are not the, at the end of the day, are not these concerns mentioned just symptoms of a three decade long coup on behalf of the moneyed class? Now, words like coup and the moneyed class, you know, there was, there was a discourse during the progressive era, including a, that which was perpetuated by scholars such as Thorsten Veblen, people on the court such as Louis Brandeis. There was a discourse about vested interests, for instance, um, that became a popular discourse. And so I also wanted to tie in here um, something that, that Andrew Doty has asked for our panelists who has worked in South Africa, how similar are electoral politics there to the US. I might change that question a little bit to ask, are there also I, imaginations of transformative politics that we can draw upon from elsewhere. So for instance, a lot of what we've talked about today thus far can be captured in a term that's very common in the media in South Africa, which is state capture, right? Everyone in South Africa knows what state capture means, that, that corporations have captured the state. And, and how might, there be an openness to importing, you know, some of these imaginations that, because what we're talking about are interactions between things like the judiciary and money and so on, that are often segregated into different domains and therefore are very difficult to organize against as a single issue. And so how do we, 
how do we think about broadening that imagination and how might we learn from elsewhere to do so? I think in the context of labor law, some of the most exciting reimagining that's happening um, has to do with the question of where labor rights spring from in the first instance. Um, the basis on which the courts upheld the National Labor Relations Act uh, was the commerce power in the Constitution, which is a very narrow way of grounding the right. The idea was that interstate commerce flows more, more smoothly when there are not disruptions. And so in some ways you can think about that way of grounding the, the right in the constitution as kind of a conservative one. The idea mm -hmm. that um, channeling industrial disputes into the bargaining process would tamp down recurrent strikes. Um, there's another way of thinking and talking about this, which some people have um, really been encouraging, which is to, to look instead to the First Amendment um, and to talk about workers' rights in terms of a freedom of association and of a freedom of speech, to talk about why picketing and striking have been relegated to um, treatment as mere conduct, when in fact it can be speech of the highest order variety. Um, so there's been this um, interesting scholarship about you know, while we may not be able to ground it afresh with the courts, we can talk and think in those terms. We can try and argue that um, these are questions of fundamental right. And so I, I really think that's an important pivot. Um, some scholars like Kate Andreas at the University of Michigan Law School speak about this in terms of small c constitutionalism. So the way we talk and encourage each other to wield our power um, matters and it can strengthen our resolve. I also think on the just sort of question of looking elsewhere for um, a different horizon, you know, there, there have been some um, really fruitful ways of connecting um, other constitutional projects, you know, where there are more explicit protections um, of economic rights, you know, again, kind of looking in terms of um, how we think about these fundamental labor protections as something more than uh, just a way to keep commerce running smoothly. Mm. Yeah, to supplement what Amanda said, I think there's been a related, maybe parallel project to denaturalize the marketplace and show that our current economic and political inequality wasn't inevitable. It isn't the product of nature or quote unquote technology or somehow divinely ordained. It's really the function of many legal and policy choices that were deliberately made starting in the 1970s and since then. And it's been useful in demystifying a lot of technocratic discourse and showing that there's no such thing as a free market. The state unavoidably allocates power to some constituents and not others. And there's nothing that says that, you know, a hedge fund manager will make $500 million a year for shuffling money around. And I think showing that sort of state action that undergirds everything has been useful in challenging the dominant neoliberal, even libertarian framework that has defined political debate. And I think these are relatively easy ideas to convey to the general public, to voters. And I think it's uh, the success of Bernie Sanders in 2016 and 2020 is a testament to that. He showed that you know, having billionaires is a policy choice. It's not something we have to accept. And obviously he didn't win either time, but he was by any measure extraordinarily successful and you know tying this back to the money issue he showed that you can actually raise a lot of money exclusively through small donations i think the idea that prevailed 5 or 10 years ago that you had to rely on corporate money to mount an effective campaign was completely shattered by his success and you know the ongoing success of uh, you know the squad and other progressives in congress Yeah, I, I think all that's right. I, I think that the the real challenge, the narrative challenge here is all around the question of inevitability and the the real genius of the right wing project that worked through think tanks and academia and so forth was to establish this inaccurate notion that the ideological project they were advancing was in fact a description. It was a descriptive natural science exercise, not, a, not an ideological project. And I think that um, that's created two, well, many, but two kind of consequences that come to mind quickly. Uh, 
One is just a sense of inevitability and despair among the electorate that uh, I think Sandeep is right, that, that you know, there are clear signs in recent electoral history that that can be, that can be chipped away at, though there's plenty of work left to be done there. And the other is just a kind of a profound, really dangerous media bias. I mean, just, just the, the fact to give a very, very simple example that deficits get covered by the press as bad and deficit gets cutting gets covered by the press as virtuous. That's a profoundly consequential ideological choice that has no basis in real economics, but is a, is a you know, is a, sign of a real victory of this ideological project. And so I think, you know, how we choose our words is important and hard. And I'm not, I'm gonna duck that question because I don't have a good answer, but, but equally important is kind of where we deploy the words to, to get, to chip away at this inevitability problem. No, and I think this naming of this as an ideological project is so important because one of the things that I'm constantly struck by coming from outside of the US is how hard it is here to have things called out as an ideological project, right? Like things are so naturalized, you know? I mean, I was, I was writing to a friend of mine in Europe um, that in, in the last 28 years, um, Republicans have only won the presidential popular vote once. And, and their response was, well, why don't Americans protest that? Like that's unthinkable in, in, in Europe, you know? Like how, how has that been so naturalized that, that we can work ourselves into a tizzy about who will win when by the standards of any other democratic nation, we kind of have always known all along who would win, right? It's only because of a very particular assemblage of legal policy and normative decisions that that, you know, that's even under question. So um, I'm going to be looking through some of these other questions. Um, there's one from, from Daniel Moschenberg. Um, he says the issue of state capture that, that I had raised is a matter of the damage done, the long lasting emptying of structures of both content and affect. So how do we reimagine a future of plenitude given that? We have about 10 minutes of time. So this might be a question for all of you to, to sort of reimagine from, from your different corners. Um, futures of, of plenitude and filling up and not just survival and staying afloat. I guess I'll start and I'll be quick. Um, you know, I think this is a this is the same as the last question on some level, right? It, it's once you analyze kind of without bias the world, it's clear that we live in a world of plenty. And it's simply you have to break through the feeling that the distribution of resources that we currently are um, subject to is somehow inevitable. And you, you, have to, you have to capture people's imagination about what a different world would be. You know, when I, was, when I was running for governor, I would say, you know, they want to tell us that we can't afford this and we can't afford that and we can't afford the other thing. Go to downtown Chicago and look up in the sky and see the skyscrapers that house the, house the private equity firms and the hedge funds and the ad agencies and tell me that we can't afford healthcare. We're choosing, we are choosing to accept an allocation of resources that, that sentences us to, an, to a, a, a situation of real, real immiseration. Um, and I think we just need to, to talk in a way that, that calls upon people to look at what they are surrounded by and, and, not, and be, try to distinguish between natural law constraints and human constraints. And, and to be as bold as possible about re-envisioning a world with different human constraints. And so I, well, I was just gonna say, in South Africa, their constitution, which is much, much younger than ours from 95, um, guarantees certain, certain um, social rights, like a right to housing, a right to healthcare. Um, our constitution um, 
even including the amendments, and I'm not a lawyer, I only play one on TV. So if I'm missing something, let me know. Um, but our constitution does not guarantee any social rights. There was a famous case in the Supreme Court about dealing with welfare. And this court decided there is no right to welfare. There is no right to um, government assistance. Um, and, and that's the sort of baseline um, in terms of our constitution that underlined the foundation of our country to say nothing of slavery or any of the other um, evils, there, was, there were no social rights and there still are no social rights. Um, so it creates, um, it creates a, a special challenge. It's got to be the people um, agitating with their elected representatives and insisting on, um, on a, new, a new world, another world is possible. I mean, that's gotta be the message from the ground up and we've gotta take it into the voting booth and we have to make it clear that if people wanna be reelected, um, they're gonna join us in reimagining this world. So before Sandeep and Amanda, you respond to the question of plenitude, let me let me darken that question with 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 David's um, David Ennis's latest question, which is that these reimaginations are also happening in the context of the tyranny of the minority, brought about by the Electoral College, but also by gerrymandering, by the Senate, the institution of the Senate itself, and by many of the forces that we've discussed: um, dark money, corporate power, and so on. So how, how would you answer the question of reimagination and plenitude, given all the structural conditions that exist for a continued tyranny of the minority, regardless of electoral outcomes and the becoming more grassroots of the Democratic Party? And I'll, I'll, I'll address that and I'll add in, I, I see we have another question in the queue that kind of, um, interweaves with all of this about you know what we can do to support actual democracy and its um, kind of flowerings you know to me my vision of plenitude my vision of what it would look like um, for labor law to function differently you know goes back to this question about how the law was originally set up you know in so many important respects the project of protecting workers rights in the national labor relations act um, was always an incomplete and faulty vision because it excluded so many important categories of workers um, and really enshrined a racialized economic order that um, we live with the consequences of today. So to me, one of those changes has to be, you know, much more widespread protection, you know, that doesn't distinguish in ways that we know um, pit workers against one another, that we know, you know, creates racialized distinctions. So that kind of interwoven story of economic and racial justice, I think is crucial. Um, that's something that we've really never approached with uh, the law that we have now. And I think that has to be the horizon of any change that we pursue. I also think that um, the question of workers' rights to organize, you know, this really does get to the root of um, a kind of majoritarian vision, a vision of, um, balancing unequal power in the workplace by actually making demands as a group, standing up and speaking out together. This is really industrial democracy. It's a term that people have, you know, thrown around a lot, but um, if we had a type of um, labor law regime that didn't create distinctions among workers, we really could come closer to that model, I think. And that would have obvious spillover effects that could change our political horizon and unlock the possibility to do so much more. Um, I also just want to add as like one other closing thought on this, that the importance of worker voice as we look to the future is going to be critical. Um, we have a lot of discourse about the future of work and automation as though any of this is 
natural or inevitable. And just to kind of pick up on some of the themes Sandeep and Daniel were discussing, I think that's one of the most pernicious examples of this logic that's being kind of sold to people that everything has to necessarily tend in the direction of reduced employment. I don't think that's true. Um, I think that worker power is one important component of shaping the kind of future we want. This is an ongoing dialogic process. It does not necessarily or deterministically have to culminate in a world where we don't have work. Work is important. It gives people dignity and, um, you know, the importance of taking the voices of people with expertise into account when considering what types of automation are socially desirable is important. And, you know, I just want to highlight um, a book that just came out um, by Frank Pasquale, which I think is absolutely critical on this question. And I'd commend it to everyone's reading. It's um, New Laws of Robotics. And, you know, the question of automation, especially in professionalized work settings, which includes healthcare and education and so many settings where a greater share of employment now takes place, there's a lot that can be done. Um, so that's that's kind of my thought. Yeah, I would echo Amanda's recommendation of Frank's new book. I think it really challenged the conventional wisdom about technological progress and denaturalize the discourse around it and show that you know, the technological progress and the pace of it is is the result of conscious human decision making, you know, in today's society, largely executives and financiers. So we could easily imagine a different model of technological advance that's controlled through democratic processes and guided and informed by worker input as opposed to capital input. I think on the plenitude question, I'm really inspired by the Green New Deal and the discourse around it. I think it's very helpful in showing that the United States is an extraordinarily wealthy country. People aren't poor and precarious because there's simply not enough to go around. There's plenty to go around. It's just monopolized by a relatively small fraction of the population. And if anything, we could be more productive given how millions, really tens of millions are chronically unemployed or underemployed. And we could actually produce more and a radically different mix of goods and services to ensure human needs and promote human thriving. And some of the skepticism around, or the growing skepticism around the tech industry, I think is very encouraging that people are starting to recognize that much of the so-called innovation that happens is, you know, these big companies and their financial backers supporting elaborate ways to evade existing laws and rules around labor and employment rights, around privacy, and much of the so-called innovation, you know, I think Uber is a great example of that, is just a large scale legal evasion scheme. There's very little innovation going on. And I think the corollary to that is we could actually shift all those resources that go into legal and regulatory evasion into genuine technological advance, whether it's in healthcare, education, or energy. Well, on that note, we are pretty much at time. I am really, really, really grateful to you, Daniel and Sami and Sandeep and Amanda for taking us through a tour de force of issues that were broad and diverse and convergent and interconnected and stark and hopeful and full of plenitude. So thank you so much. Thank you all so much um, in the audience for attending. Thanks once again to um, Anna and Carlo and Joe and everyone at 3CT. And um, stay, stay well, hang in there for the next 10 days and then the next 10 weeks after that. It's, <laughs> it's going to be quite a ride one way or another, I think, but... Uh, but as, as we have heard today with, with futures to fight for and build that are actually on the table and that are already being contested. So thank you once again and take care.